institutions, we have got to change the way that we do business. Why? Well, for starters, there was a quite embarrassing study in the UK that showed that the main reason people did not go to classical music concerts is because they had already been to a classical music concert. <laughs> Meaning they expected to be bored, they assumed it was going to be stuffy, they felt like since they weren't experts, they were going to feel out of place. Lo and behold, they went to the concert and got exactly what they expected. Don't let the headlines fool you. Concert attendance is not just down because of the hard economic downturn. People will still pay for experiences that they believe are going to make a lasting impact. So I believe that we as artists have to create an experience that does just that. And I think the only way we can do that is first we have to understand what it is that's facing us. And I see my PowerPoint is not facing us. <laughs> ah. Okay, this is called the Art of the Modern Day Concert. And I think one of the main things we're facing is this ugly guy, the remote control. Because you people use it as your weapon of mass entertainment defense. <laughs> you see a comedian in the first few seconds, you don't think he's funny, click. Smell a commercial approaching, click. Anything even remotely boring or uninteresting ahead, click. So, what that means is because you have entertainment options, you don't feel like you have to wait around to decide whether or not an artist is worth your time. What we have to do as classical musicians is we can't necessarily compete with the remote control, but we can program with variety. The same way that variety is the spice of life, it should be the spice of our concert programs. I encourage artists to program in a way that provides emotional variation that keeps your audience guessing. I think that we have to use themes to capture an evening of performance. We have to find compelling threads that tie the music together. Today I'm going to be playing works for, me, for you from a program that I put together called Russian Ruminations. Now in that program, just the title by itself immediately makes you, kind of creates an air of expectancy. The audience starts to wonder, what is this theme, Russian Ruminations? How does it relate to the artist? What kind of music is she going to be playing? Most importantly, it causes you to pull from your own personal associations with the theme. So I always encourage artists to do just that. The other thing we have facing us that goes hand in hand with the remote control is the expectation of instant access. Today's audiences are expecting to get everything they want right away. In terms of media, they get it fast, they even get it free. We're more used to listening to 30 second snippets on iTunes than two hour long recitals. How the heck does a classical musician compete with that? I say we don't compete with it. Instead, we give our audience an opposite experience. We create an escape. How many of you, of you in here who love instant access to everything are also burnt out by instant access to everything? Anyone? Yes, I wanted to burn my Blackberry only about five times this week. So you know what I'm talking about. So as an artist, one of the main things we have to do is provide an escape to what goes on, the madness that goes on outside of the concert hall. I'm going to start by playing a piece of music by Rachmaninoff, one of my favorite Russian composers. And it's a piece that I often use to start a program because it creates that escape that I mentioned. Now, I happen to love horror movies. I don't know if Rachmaninoff felt the same way, but I do know that he was obsessed with this piece of music, this tune, that's often used in horror movies. It's called the Dies Ere. If you don't know the tune, you if you don't know the title, you've probably heard this tune. Very spooky. Well, he takes it and he reinvents it. He loved this tune so much, he used it in a bunch of his compositions. But in this case, he turns it into something that's not so ominous, but rather creates the escape that I was talking about. So if you had a frenetic pace that you were running outside of the hall, you hear something like this and it's completely an opposite experience.
So after we have figured out that we need to program with variety and create escape for the audience, we are met with this big competitor. A lot of the gap right now between today's concert artists and the younger generation especially is the seduction of multimedia. You saw it right here with Hip Hop Troop that was on before me. The younger generation expects loud music, sound effects, brilliant special effects, lots of people on stage. So the idea of coming to a concert where there's one artist, no backup singers, no fireworks is almost frightening to a generation that is used to having to multitask both orally and visually. The way that we combat that, uh, combat that is extremely complicated, so brace yourself for this complex solution. It's just to use multimedia as well. Uh, whenever it's appropriate to die hard classical music lovers, the idea of inserting technology sometimes into the program seems ludicrous. But when it's appropriate, it really can enhance the experience. I tour a program called Revolutionary Rhythm that allows me to actually use uh, loop pedals where I'm replicating sounds, I'm playing all sorts of crazy things inside the piano. I have a guy on stage with me who's actually doing live electronic hip hop beats. That's not what I brought for you today, it's an extensive experience, but what I brought for you is something <coughs> much simpler that still allows for a unique and memorable concert experience. I tour another program called Hearing Color Seeing Sound. And admittedly, this program for me brings in more art lovers and psychology buffs than it does music lovers. And that's completely fine with me as an artist. The Russian composer Alexander Scriabin and the Russian painter, famous Russian painter, Vasily Kandinsky, both shared a condition. It's a psychological phenomenon called synesthesia, which in layman's terms you can think of as an involuntary fusion of the senses. So for Scriabin, when he heard specific notes on the piano, uh, he saw a very specific color to go with it. So for him, uh, the key of C looked like or sounded like the color red to him. For Kandinsky, the opposite was true. When he saw color, he swore that he involuntarily also heard specific sound to go with that color. So I thought, why not pair the artwork of Kandinsky with the music of Scriabin? Now, when I tour this program, I have 24 short preludes that go with different pieces of artwork. But today, I've brought you just this one piece of artwork. Now, when you look at art, that's one experience by itself. But when you hear it with music, it actually gives the artwork a backstory that you start to make up in your head. Now, I'm going to play for you two very short preludes by Scriabin, one in D major, one followed directly by one in D minor. For Scriabin, the key of D was the color yellow. So I picked a work by Kandinsky where yellow is the dominant color. And I want you to see for yourself if the artwork begins to change as far as it's, it's not gonna move, but see if in your head uh, you start to experience a different mood. Maybe the characters uh, start to look differently once you hear the second prelude. But just look at the differences between what the artwork looks like to you between the first and second prelude.
nice during the second piece, I don't think. It comes around. So we've dealt with three things, but this last one. Controversial aspect of entertainment today, for better or for worse, it seems like it's here to stay, and that's reality TV. Today's audiences expect to know everything about the artists they love, especially the artists they love to hate. Right? They want to know details about personal habits, preferences, and especially our vices. I say the really easy way to combat that phenomenon is simply to go with it. I say that even as classical musicians, we can make our experiences in the concert hall much more personal. I always challenge artists to reach over the stage mics and connect in a tangible way with our audiences. I think when you do that, you leave a connection that's very memorable. Uh, for instance, for me, I fell in love with all things Russian after reading Anna Karenina. Now, I fell in love with Tolstoy's writing, especially his glorious use of way too many adjectives. I loved it so much that when I found out I was pregnant with my first child, my only son, Jaden, I decided I was going to read War and Peace. Now, I decided I was going to read War and Peace during labor. Um, so any moms or dads who accompanied the birth of their child know that that probably didn't go as planned. It didn't. Uh, but it didn't dampen my curiosity for Russian music, Russian art, Russian literature, and that's how I came up with the program Russian Illuminations. When audiences come to a concert hall, yes, they want to hear the music, but they do want to know more about the artist who's playing the music, why is he or she playing that music, and I think that when we as artists begin to think not just about impressing the audience with flashy pieces of music, but when we think about engaging the audience, we get that much closer to keeping your fingers off of the mental click button, if you know what I mean. I think what we have to do is put the needs of the audience if not first, at least a close second behind the needs of the composer, the needs of the music itself. You balance these things, you come up instantly with a memorable concert experience. You have to have emotion that's balanced with intellect, information, and entertainment. We should have a sense of the familiar as well as a sense of adventure, sensitivity, and bravura that goes with how we actually program the pieces. And I think this last element is, is probably the element that's most missing in concert halls is the idea of having mystique and discovery that kind of gets revealed throughout the entire concert process. I think when we do this, we leave an impact on our audiences. There are a lot of people who are going to say, why even bother trying to get the attention of today's ADD generation? I say that as an artist, it's our job to pull in new audiences, to cater to the needs of our current audiences, and to even proselytize the poor guy who happened to accidentally walk in on our concert uh, by mistake. He or she should leave having a positive concert experience. I'm going to end with a piece by Rachmaninoff, if you haven't guessed yet, it's my favorite composer. This is his most popular piece ever. It's the C-sharp minor prelude. So popular that even if you don't know the title, you've probably heard these first three notes because they have been ripped off by musicians in just about every genre possible, and it's made its way into many a movie soundtrack. I end with it because it leaves the type of lasting impact that I think all artists should try to incorporate throughout their entire concert experience and their entire careers. I hope you'll enjoy it, and I hope you've enjoyed the art of the modern day concert.